is Dr. Casey Bundock, and I'm pleased to welcome you this morning. I'm pleased to welcome PD2 back and to see your smiling faces early this morning. You all know what to anticipate this morning. You're looking forward to your second semester of professional development. PD1, you're probably not really sure what you're getting into this morning. But we want to assure you that what you're about to be joining is a really fantastic journey that you're at the beginning of. How I'd like to start off our session this morning is to let the faculty members and the field experience instructors that are here introduce themselves. What we'll do is we'll have a general session where you all will be with me to receive some just overall information about PD 1 and 2 this morning. And then you'll have the opportunity to go upstairs and meet with your field experience instructors. And these ladies will be guiding you through your field work this semester. So they have some fantastic things they want to share with you this morning to help you to get ready for your PD 1 and 2 semesters. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Casey Bundock. I am the director for the Center of Professional Development of Teachers. And what that means is I work with you all in PD 1 and 2, as well as PD 3 when you become student teachers. I also work very closely with our district partners to understand their needs so that we can prepare you for getting those jobs that you want once you graduate. I'll also be working with those of you that are enrolled in PD2 that have coursework in Ailey. I'll be your Read 4303 instructor. And I'd like now to sort of go around the room and the faculty and the field experience instructors would like to have an opportunity to introduce themselves as well. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Lee Van Horn and I'm so happy to be here this morning to welcome you and I don't know if anybody's probably we're about equally excited. You know, you're in, the, you're in your final stages of becoming a teacher, and I can't wait to get those emails from you letting me know how great this is all going. Uh, already as I look around the room, I see some real professionals. You look, you look good. You look excited. You look focused. Um, I guess I have a little bit of news for you if you, haven't, if you haven't seen it on the web. I'm also the new dean of the College of Public Service, so... Um, <laughs> So I think probably we both are equally excited and nervous <laughs> with equal aspirations to be the best we can be. So I think uh, you have taught me how to do this job and I'm going to use what I know about being an educator to do the very best I can for this entire college as you are going to be doing the very best you can for the students you'll be teaching. So my heart is with you every day of your life and I will be in that office by the round glass building so you'll know where I am and I'll be looking for you on the moments that you're here and in the hallways. I love you. Good morning, my name is Jeresia Hannah. I'm the new uh, teacher certification officer here for, the, uh, for Urban Education. Um, my job is to help you all get approved for your Texas State exams and recommend you for your certification right when you get ready, to, when you graduate. Um, and my goal for you all is to get you to take your state exams early, to be successful, not to wait till the last minute, and for all of you to graduate as Texas certified teachers. I'll be in the advising center on the fourth floor, so if you guys think of any questions or have any issues, please come by and see me. All right, I think that's everybody. Faculty, are we covered? Okay. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you a little bit about what we'll be covering this morning in our session so that you know what you'll be able to look forward to. We're going to start off with a general orientation. We're going to be taking a look at some of the highlights of our PD handbook so that you understand the expectations as you move forward in this semester. We're also going to take a look at something that will enable you to be prepared when you take your state exams. So we offer something called a diagnostic experience where you're able to take some exams here on campus to prepare you before you take the actual Texas exam. And I'll give you the very specific details of that this morning so you can prepare. We also want to let you know a little bit about what we call teacher forgiveness for those of you that might have loans. As you're getting closer and co closer to graduation, that might be on your mind. So we want you to know some of the options that you have. We also have some of our professional organizations here this morning that would like to share what their organization is about and invite you to join them. So PD2. You guys are experts, you know how this goes, but there have been some updates and some revisions. So even though you're familiar with the PD semesters, please keep your eyes and ears open to be receptive to those changes. PD1, take a deep breath. You may be feeling a little bit overwhelmed right now. And you're going to be receiving a lot of information this morning from me and from your supervisors. But please know, this is just the first of many meetings and many classes for you. 
And the individuals that are in this room and the rest of our faculty are here to support you every step of the way. So we don't want you to leave today feeling overwhelmed. We want you to leave today feeling like, okay, I kind of get the gist of what's going to happen next. And I'm open to what I need to plan for doing and I'm ready for the hard work that's ahead. So this is just an introduction uh, to your semester that you have ahead. We have a Department of Urban Education, which is a bit different from other programs that we have in the area, even in the state. The goal of our department is to help to prepare you all to work with at-risk students and at-risk populations. As you take a look at some of our partner districts that are listed here, you might think, well, those aren't traditionally thought of as being at-risk districts. All of our partner districts, we currently have nine partner districts, have numerous campuses that are considered Title I campuses that are very diverse and we seek to work with these districts and campuses because of their diverse populations so we look forward to placing you on these campuses so that we can appreciate this diversity and also to support um, these at-risk students that are needing our help yes we have a new faculty member if you could join us and introduce yourself dr Beebe. yeah hi um i'm dr Beebe. i will be um <coughs> Trying, well, I'm not going to say I'm going to try and fill Dr. Garcia's shoes because I don't wear high heels. <laughs> um, but I will be uh, serving this year as the interim chair of the department. Um, I think I'll be in the same office. Um, so um, I have a pretty much an open door policy. So if you have any questions or problems uh, or anything good to say, um, feel free to stop by. Thank you, Dr. Dean. We're so pleased to welcome you. The districts that are listed here are those that we have partnerships with for PD 1 and 2. Please note that as you move forward to PD 3 to do student teaching, there are a few extra districts that are not listed here that you may choose to do your student teaching in. So PD 2, I know you're just beginning PD 2, but the PD 3 application is coming your way soon. So you will be able to choose from these districts with which you're familiar, and there are some additional districts from which you may choose as well. Let's take a look at the preparation standards by which we're governed. So you all have been working in your pre-PD and your PD-1 classes using the TEKS. You recognize that these are guiding the curriculum and the standards of the students that you're working with. We also want to recognize that the standards are measured by the exams that you'll be taking and that hopefully PD-2 you've already started to take. So at the end of PD-1, you'll be eligible to take your first exam for certification. That's the PPR. This is for students that will be teaching students EC through 12, you'll take one exam. So PD2, if you haven't yet taken your PPR, know that Dr. Bhattacharjee and I are going to be knocking on your door and asking you when you're going to be registering for that exam because since you completed PD1 successfully, you're now eligible. Those of you that are enrolled in PD1, when you successfully complete the semester in the spring, you'll be eligible to take that first exam. At the end of PD2, when you successfully complete those courses, you're eligible to take your second exam. And that's the content exam. So based on your area of certification, that's going to look different for all of you. But each of you will be eligible to take that exam upon completion of PD2. And as Dr. Bhattacharjee mentioned earlier, we want you to take those exams as soon as you can because there's lots of fantastic jobs to be had out there. And I will share with you that every time I meet with our district partners, they are eager, very eager to hire UHD graduates, but they always say, Casey, tell them they have to have their exams complete. So I share that with you. It's not just one or two districts. All of our districts are adamant. They can't hire you if you don't have your exams. Our goal is for you to have your exams complete before you start student teaching. So we're going to support you in that goal. All of your faculty and supervisors will continue to support you to reach that goal so that you can be hired when you're ready at graduation. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of PD 1 and 2. So this will be valuable for you to understand the kind of coursework that you'll be taking while you're with us in these two semesters. So in PD 1, the focus is generally on understanding the learner. So in our programs in the EC365 Lingual Generalist and in our 4 through 8 programs, we're really looking at a lot of courses on content and methods. And for our secondary groups, we're taking a look at understanding the learner, the classroom environment, and professional roles. In PD2, your classes are similar, but you're really, your classes kind of shift in taking a look at enhancing student achievement. So in EC365 Lingual and 4 through 8 programs, we're really looking at some of those uh, content methods classes and our secondary students are looking at literacy instructional design and assessment so based on your certification area you have various courses that you're 
needing to take for PD1 and 2. Another note that we want to make is that you've registered for another course. If you're in PD1, you've registered for PED4380. If you're in PD2, you've registered for PED4381. And that's your field work class. So it's not an academic class like you've had in your pre-PD courses, but rather, in this course, you're assigned to work with the supervisor, and you're assigned a mentor at a campus that's a district partner with us. So you'll go out on this campus for a minimum of 60 hours. That may sound like a large chunk of time PD1, but imagine breaking up that 60 hours over 10 weeks, so you're only on the campus about six hours a week. So you're going to have a phenomenal experience this semester taking everything that you've learned here at the university and putting it into practice out in the field. So you'll be with one of our fantastic district partners for about six hours a week doing observation and helping out in those classrooms. You'll also have the chance to teach two lessons in those classes. And our fantastic field experience instructors are going to be there to support you and observe you. So that's an exciting component that we like to offer to you that many other universities don't have in place. I want to recognize the academic criteria for PD1 and PD2. These are some components that are available within our PD handbook. So I'll show you where that is a little while later in our morning session. When you go to meet with your supervisor later this morning, she's going to ask you to recognize that you've heard about certain components of our program, like our goal to work with at-risk students, uh, like our, the structure of our program that I've just noted. Also, to take a look at the criteria for being in PD1 and 2. So this is one of those components where later this morning you'll recognize, I have heard this information, I acknowledge this information, and I know I can read further about it in the PD handbook. So let's take a look at the criteria for these two semesters. While you're in PD1 and 2, you must maintain a GPA of 2.5 or greater in order to remain in the program. So it's very important that you're watching your studies, you're watching your grades, and you're moving forward with your hard work. You'll also be completing nine semester hours of integrated coursework. So for your academic courses, you must make a C or better to move forward to the next PD. And that includes student teaching for PD2 folks. So you want to see or better in all of those academic courses. You won't be able to go to the next PD semester until you have a C or better in, the, in your current PD that semester that you're currently enrolled. There's three different places where you can look and receive further documentation if you feel like you need further explanation on this point. You have your degree plan that you've set up with your advisor. There's a PD handbook that I'll show you in just a moment how to locate that. And there's also your UHD catalog. So while I'm speaking of the PD handbook, I'm going to exit out of this and I want to show you where that's located. So we're going to go to the Urban Ed homepage. On the Urban Ed homepage, if you scroll down to Professional Development, you're going to see that the second link here is for Professional Development Handbook. So this is a rather lengthy document. It's about 85 pages, but it gives you all the criteria for PD 1 and 2. The first half of the handbook is really for you all, for PD 1 and 2. And when you enter PD 3, the other half of the handbook will be for you at that time. So I want to encourage you, you're just getting a glimpse of it this morning. If you want to read further, I encourage you to read further prior to next week. You can find this very easily on the Urban Ed homepage, now that you know where you can find it under those professional development links. Some other academic criteria for PD1 and PD2 show that you're no longer in these pre-PD courses. Then you were just a student, but now we look to you as a teacher candidate. We look to you as a professional. So there are some things that we expect of professionals. We expect participation, preparedness, and professionalism in all your PD activities, whether it's in your academic courses, if you're out in the field with a mentor, if you're meeting with your peers in a cohort, we always have that professionalism in mind. We also expect that you're going to communicate clearly, effectively, and professionally at all times. We're really stepping it up a notch. You're used to professionally communicating with your professors you have academic writing that you do for your professors. But you have a whole new group of people you're working with this semester. You're now working with your field experience instructors. These ladies are guiding you in your field work. So any time you have a meeting with your supervisor, any time that you have a phone conversation or you're sending an email, you're representing yourself professionally at that point. Because they are a fantastic resource for you, and down the line, they may be a fantastic reference for you when you're seeking that first job. So they are really here to guide and support you. 
also know even in PD 1 and 2, you're already out there doing your pre-job interview. We have numerous students that tell us and come back and say, I kept track of my mentor and my principal from PD 1 and PD 2 and now I have a job offer on that campus. So even now in PD 1 and PD 2, we always encourage you to be professional in your communication on those campuses. Whether it's verbal communication, you're hanging out in the teacher's lounge or in the workroom, uh, it might be a phone call to the principal, it might be an email to your mentor. All of that communication is clear, effective, and professional so that you're best representing yourself as you're getting ready to go out into the field. There are some criteria that you'll want to adhere to while you're in PD1 and PD2. PD2, these are going to look familiar. PD1, please know that as you meet with your supervisors this morning, they're going to tell you a little bit more about these items. First of all, we already know that you need a C or better in your academic classes to move forward. You also must receive a satisfactory rating from your field experience instructor. And the way that we determine a satisfactory rating is by the seven, it's called the Teacher Candidate for Criteria Fieldwork Component. And that can be found on page 27 of the handbook if you want to jot that down for when you look at the handbook later this week, hopefully. When you're out in the field with your field experience instructor, they're going to be looking for certain qualities to make sure that you're representing yourself as a professional in the field. Are you doing things that your mentor is asking you to do? Are you completing thorough lesson plans? Are you turning in those lesson plans in a timely manner? Are you acting in an ethical way on campus? So there's seven criteria that they're going to look for to ensure that you're behaving professionally and they can give you a satisfactory rating so you can move on to the next semester. So in PED 4380 and 81, you don't get an A, B, or C. You get a satisfactory or unsatisfactory. And you're required to have a satisfactory to move on to the next semester. So your field experience instructor will be supporting you in understanding what those criteria are so you can move forward successfully. Also in the handbook, there are two other documents I want to encourage you to make note of, of the pages so that you can anticipate the standards that you should be upholding. First is a code of ethics, and this is given to us by TEA, the Texas Education Agency. I also want to encourage you to take a look at our own uh, department's professional attributes for teacher candidates on page 28, and this will share with you the kind of standards that you want to be meeting while you're out in the field. So we know the criteria for academic courses, we recognize the criteria for field work, and now let's consider what the states and districts are expecting of us. All of our district partners, and I think there's six that we'll be working with within this room, require a background check. So this is a requirement for you all to go out onto campuses and begin your field work. Those of you that are parents and you visited your children in school, you know how they scan your driver's license, they wrap after you before you go in? This is a similar process. They want to make sure that we're all acceptable to come and work with children in the public schools. So, today, you are going to be receiving information about how to complete the background check. Let me share with you, some of your field experience supervisors are going to give you a letter from me, and it gives you directions on how to fill out an online background check. Please read those directions very carefully. All of our districts have very, very different background check, check processes. So, you may have a friend in another district that says they have to do it one way. I need you to adhere to the directions you receive today because every district is very different. So, if your supervisor gives you a letter today from me stating that you have an online background check, you are required to complete that by this Friday. It will be noted in that letter, but I just want to make it very clear to you. We need you to complete that online background check by this Friday because on Monday, I'm going to the districts to give them your name so they know who to expect. Some of you will not be doing an online background check. Today, some of your field experience instructors will hand you a paper background check, and it's going to ask you some personal information, your name, your email address, phone number. Um, they want to know address where you currently live as well as any other previous addresses that you can recall. Please be as thorough as possible. If you do a paper background check, you're submitting that to your supervisor today, and I will be delivering that to the districts later this week. So this is something that we handle before the semester starts so we can get you out in the field as soon as possible. Please note, it takes a few weeks for the background checks to clear. So I know some of you are very excited to go out in the field and begin right away. 
We're not going to be able to do that because we have to wait two to three weeks for those background checks to clear. So your field experience instructors will, keeping you, will be keeping you up to date as to when you'll be able to go out into the field based on the background check clearance. All right, so we've talked about the academic criteria for being in PD1 and PD2. Part of our goal today is also to help you plan ahead. So we want you to be prepared for this semester, but we also want to recognize, hey, I'm almost to the end of my program, but I need to plan ahead and make sure I can complete that successfully. So I also want us to recognize today the certification recommendation requirements. So when you graduate, the university will, re will recommend you for certification, making sure that you've met these guidelines. So let's make sure we understand what we need to do to graduate and be certified as well. You still must maintain that 2.5 GPA. You must complete all your courses successfully so your, your professors and your supervisors will let you know how you'll be able to do that. We've talked about that criteria to pass the field work component. So that will be in place for PD 1 and 2. You're going to meet those seven criteria. You're going to adhere to the academic and professional policies that UHD brings forward to you in that code of ethics and those standards that I previously mentioned, and I'm encouraging you to take a look at the handbook. You also must pass your exams. So bilingual candidates, you already know about the BTLPT. If you've not yet taken that, now's the time. Because you won't be eligible to take your next exam until the end of the semester. So if you've not yet taken the BTLPT, this is a great time to do that. Remember, at the end of the semester, you can take the PPR. At the end of PD2, you can take the content. You cannot be recommended for certification until those exams are passed. So please note that is a certification recommendation requirement. Uh, you may not have any holds or fees owed to the university, and you would not be on academic probation if you have your 2.5 GPA. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharji, this might be a good time for you to address the group. Dr. Bhattacharji is the chair of our Student Success Initiative Committee, and she can certainly speak to the importance of passing these exams, and she has a lot of things in place for you to support you as you're seeking certification through passing these exams. Okay. What we're going to do, and uh, in all the classes, we are doing a survey that I ask some of your faculty members to send it to you so that I know where we are related to the, to the test. Mainly, it's going to happen in PD2 because by the, uh, uh, by the end of PD1, you are allowed to take the BTLPT if you are bilingual and also the PPR. So you should be done by those, with those two tests if you are going to be beginning PD2. And then to support you on that, we plan a study groups and I'm still making a decision what would be the best time to do the study groups. The study groups, sometimes you will have a faculty member that will help you to study for the test. And sometimes you will study within your group. So we probably would be alternating, and I'm thinking maybe Friday would be a good day to offer the study groups. So here, the focus then is for you to study with other classmates. It's very important that you help each other, especially when you, um, there are things that you may not understand and then the other person got it. And that's good that you study in groups. The other one that we are offering is the review sessions. In the review session, you will have a faculty member that volunteer their time to teach, a, let's say, PPR for three hours. And you will get the schedule, and please don't ignore the schedule. We do massive uh, emails, and we do it through the Gator email. If you are not checking your Gator email, you have to because that's the way we communicate. The other thing also, I will be monitoring your progress, and then if you have taken the test, and you, for some reason, you haven't passed, I will need to see you, especially if you have taken the test twice and you still haven't passed that test, so we can do a personal plan for you, but the main thing is that you need to communicate. You need to communicate with me, and then uh, I will do everything I can to, to help you and assist you. We, we weren't here during the month of July, 
And I was a little bit surprised that not very many students came to the review, but the students that came to the review, they took the test and they passed. So we are helping, but we cannot do it everything by ourselves. You're gonna have to do your part, which means you're gonna to, you have to be very serious with this because you can imagine if you get to PD3, and our goal is that you have all the tests completed by the by the beginning of PD3. If you uh, PD3 is really intensive, if you think a PD1 was intensive and PD2 also, well PD3 is even more. You don't want to go to PD3 without, with all these three or two tests to take. So you want to have that out of your way so that you concentrate on getting your job. So the university helping you, the department already have established procedures to assist you, but you have to do your share. You have to put this on your schedule. Even though it's not there, you need to put this as one of the things that you will do this semester. I'm going to pass this test, and when I get to PD3, I'm going to have to deal with this. Right now, I'm dealing with a student who already graduated. They have a still, they have testing pending. And again, we're going to be helping them, but it's like, it's a, it's, you don't want to get a job. I mean, well, you're going to get a job, let me say this. But it would be a difference between getting $50,000 a standard salary to get paid by hours, maybe between 60 to 80 per day. So that's the difference, no benefits, and also uh, you can enjoy TRS, I believe. So this is a lot of advantage for you to get this testing done. So don't hesitate to come, contact me, and I will work with you. I guarantee you that. Okay, well, um, take advantage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharji. Uh, I want to reiterate what Dr. Bhattacharji said and recognizing, please don't ignore these emails, and please do check your Gator mail. If you're not in the habit, I know most students don't check their Gator mail because you have other email accounts. You can go into your Gator Mail account and have your messages forwarded so that you know you'll receive notification when you have something in Gator Mail. That's how I will contact you, Dr. Bhattacharji, your faculty advising. It's imperative that you either start checking Gator Mail frequently or have your messages forwarded. So uh, thank you for your insight into how you'll be supporting our students. There are some additional certification recommendations. These are things that you'll be hearing from me about when you're in PD3. Uh, you'll also go through PD2. You've already set up your TEAL account, likely. This is how you're able to register for your exams. Then later, you'll be able to apply for certification once you've met all these requirements. There's some other paperwork. You'll need a recommendation request that you'll apply for online. And then you'll be able to earn your degree. So we just want for you to anticipate and recognize these are some things I need to plan ahead for. And your faculty will be there to support you all the way. And you'll be receiving very specific communication from me as well to get through these various steps. Okay, we're going to shift gears pretty drastically now. I've been giving you some general information about our program and your requirements. Right now I want to talk very specifically about how we're going to support you with your testing and preparing for that testing during this semester. So you know the value of getting these exams passed before you're in PD3. So I'd like to share with you the process that we'll go through this semester to enable you to do that. We have what we call the diagnostic experience. This is required during these two semesters. It has three functions. First, it's going to help you understand what you already know really well from your coursework and also what you still need to work on. What do you need to study? We're going to help you know test taking skills. So when you go to take your exam, we have testing services actually set up the exam exactly how the state looks when you test. So we want you to know those procedures so you're not feeling nervous when you go to test. We also want to be able to inform your faculty members. If we have a group of students that's doing really well in certain competencies and others are really weak in, we want to be able to tailor our instruction to support you. So this is for your benefit as well as your faculty's benefit so that we can help to support you better in the classroom. Let's talk about the actual test day. PD2, I know you've done this, but let me provide you some reminders. PD1, I'd like to encourage you to take notes during this part of the session if you've not yet done that. 
We're also going to have a video posted on the Urban Ed webpage. Right, the link will be right next to where I showed you where the handbook was. So in the upcoming days, you can take a look and see when that's posted. So this will be there. You'll be able to have a refresher on what you need to bring the day of the test. But it's going to take notes now so you can prepare. I've been very specific in this information as testing services has very specific expectations because they're following state guidelines. So what to bring on the test day? You will receive an admission ticket and I'll share with you the date on which you'll receive that soon. So through your Gator Mail account, you'll receive an email from testing services. That admission ticket that you receive, you must print. You may not bring your phone and say, here it is. Um, you may not just show up, you must have a printed copy. We'll remind you of that before the testing day and testing services will remind you of that in the email. You must bring, and this is a big deal, you must bring a, an ID. And what's required through the state exams is a non-expired, non-damaged, government-issued photo ID. Generally what this is is your Texas driver's license. If your Texas driver's license name does not match the name on your UHD records, that's going to be problematic and they will not let you into the test. I can help you with that though. If you're ladies, if you're thinking, oh no, I just got married, my name isn't changed. We can work with that. We need for you to start thinking about getting your new ID, but in the meantime, jot yourself a note right now. Email Dr. Bundock today. What do I need to do to make this happen? Because your UHD name is going to appear on your admission ticket and then you're going to be bringing your Texas driver's license with a different name. They will not let you into the session. And they do that because it would be the same way on your true Texas exam. So know that there's a plan to get you into the test, but I need you to address me in order to do that. You also need to bring plenty of sharpened pencils. So your admission ticket, your Texas driver's license, and pencils is what you need to bring. Here's what you may not bring, and these are very specific items, but te testing services has provided me with this list, so I'm going to share it with you. <coughs> don't bring personal belongings. Don't bring your UHD ID. They will not let you in with that ID. Uh, don't bring wireless communication devices, copying devices, or listening devices, hats, digital watches, alarm watches, or wristwatch cameras. Don't bring notes. Some of you in your content exam, spe specifically secondary candidates, uh, scratch paper will likely be provided. Don't bring dictionaries, books, other uh, unauthorized testing aids. Don't bring mechanical pencils, pens, highlighters, rulers, or calculators. Secondary math, you will be offered a calculator during the exam. You may not bring food, beverages, or tobacco products. So truly, truly, admission ticket, Texas driver's license, pencils. And obviously your car keys. I would suggest leave everything in the trunk of your car. Leave it in your trunk of your car before you leave home so nobody sees that you're putting things in your trunk. And when you arrive at the testing center, you'll just have your admission ticket, your driver's license, and your pencils ready to go. Uh, I put a note here that testing services does not have storage areas. So you really will truly need to adhere to these guidelines. I know this sounds uh, a bit strict on our part, but please know we are simply mirroring the Texas exam so that you'll know truly what to expect when you go to take your state exam. Here's some important dates that you'll want to jot in. On August 25th, so this Friday, you'll notice if you're logging into your account online that you will be billed $40. And it's going to say something about testing services. So it won't likely say urban education. You can look for a $40 charge from testing services. You will need to pay your $40 before you can take the exam. If you've already made your first of your payment this semester, you're in good shape. If you have financial aid, they're going to make that first installment and you'll be covered. So just check online, check your bill, and you're going to see that $40 will be assessed and that's for the pre and post diagnostic test. On August 29th, so the following week, you're going to be checking your Gator Mail account. On August 29th, they're going to send you that admission ticket. So you want to go ahead and print that ticket. I want to suggest, you may want to make a note of this, also save that email because you're going to use the very same admission ticket for the post-test at the end of the semester. So print your ticket for the pre-test, save the email for the post-test. If you get your admission ticket and you say, oh no, there's no way I can go on this date because testing services is going to say this is your testing date. 
you think, oh no, my brother's getting married in Dallas that day, or oh, you know, I, I can't make it that day because I have a specialist appointment I have to go to, then you'll need to make contact with testing services. I've noted uh, the testing director's name, Dr. Shaquilla Farmer, as well as her email, and that will be on the admission ticket as well. So if you're thinking, I have a conflict, I can't make this, it is imperative that you contact her by September 5th at farmers at uhd.edu. So those will be the procedures that we're following. If you're thinking PD-1, this is a lot to take in at once, it's okay because we're going to be supporting you. You're going to have faculty that are supporting you and understanding these procedures. I'm also going to be sending you update reminder emails so that you'll understand the steps that you need to follow. Please make a note of these dates that are offered here. September 12th through 13th is when you'll be taking your pre-diagnostic. If you're in PD-1, you're going to take a pre-diagnostic exam for the PPR because that's what you're going to be preparing for this semester. You might be thinking, what do I need to study? How do I need to prepare? <coughs> you're just going to go. You're just going to go take the exam. We don't want you to be stressed out about it. You're going to be preparing for this exam all semester. So when you take the post-test at the end of the semester, you're going to say, I really did cover a lot of this content this semester, and now I'm preparing for the exam. So your testing date will be either the 12th or the 13th. Your admission ticket will reveal that to you. PD2, you guys know you're going to be taking content based on your certification area for the pre and post. If you're an ACP candidate, your schedule looks a little bit different. Because of state requirements for ACP, you guys are going to start off on the pretest with your content exam, and you're going to do the PPR for your post exam, and I will follow up via email to share that with you. For the post-diagnostic, I've offered the dates here. It's November 7th or 8th. So you'll be taking another exam, PPR or content, to say, okay, I've really worked hard this semester. We've covered a lot of ground. I'm feeling more prepared. And I'm going to do one last practice test before I go out and take the real exam. So at the beginning of November, you'll have that opportunity. So we feel very strongly that by offering you these practice tests for you to see the kind of questions the state will be asking and putting you in that testing scenario that testing services will offer, you'll have a really firm foundation in preparing for that actual exam that you'll be eligible to take at the end of the semester. Let's talk about what happens when we receive the results of these exams. So, what we do is I'll be reviewing your scores, Dr. Bhattacharji, your faculty, and we'll see how you're scoring on the pre and post. If you take that pre-test on September 12th or 13th and you do really well, you score 80% or better, you have the option not to take the post-test. The state requires that you get 80% to pass, and so we feel like if you get that on the pre-test, then you don't have to take the post-test, but we recommend it because a little extra practice never hurts anybody. I will tell you also, students in the past that made an 80 on the pretest, I would say 90% of them take the post test because they just want a little extra practice. So, if you do not make an 80, you will automatically take the post test. We want you to have that one last chance to prepare for the actual Texas exam. So, let's talk about your score on the post test. If you get an 80%, then we're going to recommend you to go ahead and take your exam. So we're going to sign you up for the state. We're going to say they're ready to take PPR now, or they're ready to take content now. Let's say you don't get the 80% on the post test. That's okay. You just probably want a little bit more practice. So what we're going to ask that you do, if you don't get an 80 on the post test, is that you do a review. So there's a free online review that we will share with you, and you can prepare better for that test. Once you take that review, we'll let you sign up for this exam. So it's just a one more step to make sure you're really feeling truly prepared to go out and take that exam. So let's make sure that we understand, I'm going to ask you to sign off with your supervisors that you've talked about these criteria because part of the criteria for PD-1 and PD-2 is to take these exams. So in PD-1 you're meeting the criteria to take the PPR after the semester. In PD-2 you're meeting the criteria to take the content exam after the semester. Your approval to register and is we're making sure that you've completed all your courses successfully and you have that 80% or you take that exam, uh, pardon me, that review. Based on that approval, you'll be able to take your actual exam after the semester. <coughs> you'll see here I've noted the Texas exams all currently cost $120 to take. So because that is 
a fairly high price, we want you to feel prepared. We don't want you to go in and think, oh, I don't know if I can pass this and I've just thrown $120 away. We really want you to feel confident about paying your $120 and taking that exam. So this gives you a chance um, to show your success after the course and it gives us a chance to support you. Dr. Padron. Yes, and, uh, did you mention the fee for the exams? I know, we all know because we've been there, you are very tight budgets. And so if you're anticipating taking an exam, start putting aside some money so that when you are ready to submit your application, you will not be scrambling for cash. So as much as you're planning to be successful in the exam, also start budgeting your money. So putting your nickels and dollars and all that couch change, put it in a bin because they always come in hand. Especially for bilingual candidates because you really have to take a so budget for that as well. Thank you so much for that suggestion. So you'll have four months until you're eligible to take this exam. So think about how you can budget for four months and save that $120 that you need. We know it's taxing to have to pay that huge loan at one time. So I'm grateful for that suggestion to plan ahead. All right, so we know about the pre-diagnostic now and the post-diagnostic, and we know how that's gonna prepare us for our exams. Something I wanna share with you on a, another level is talking to you about what we call loan forgiveness. So many of you have student loans, and you may be concerned about, how is this going to work when I graduate? How am I going to pay this off? Do I have some options? I'll be very honest with you that this is not my area of expertise. So I've gathered some information for some of our friends up the hill, and I'm gonna share it with you today, as well as some contact information. If you're wanting to plan ahead, and you're thinking, I'm going to need help with these loans after I graduate, what do I do? So, Teacher loan, for teacher loan forgiveness, uh, you would be considered the borrower. So the borrower must be eligible for this program. You must be working in a at-risk or a Title I campus like the campuses you'll be at this semester. So if you were to be eligible for this program of loan forgiveness, you would want to be at an at-risk or Title campus for at least five consecutive years, being the teacher of record. You could be eligible um, it's, it's, this is already in place, so you all would be eligible for any of your certification areas for loan forgiveness. And there's some more specific items that I'll share with you, and this especially might be relevant for some of our secondary folks. You might be eligible for even more. So, you could receive up to $5,000 of loan forgiveness if you are in that at-risk school for at least five years. <coughs> also, if you are working with specific populations, particularly at the secondary level. Uh, if you're the qualified teacher for math or science in a secondary school, or even special education, you could receive up to $17,500 in loan forgiveness if that is gonna be the area that you go into. But again, you would need to be at that at-risk campus for five or more consecutive years to, re to be eligible for loan forgiveness. I've offered an email address here for you since this is just a snapshot, if you want to start planning ahead and you're thinking, I could really benefit from this loan forgiveness, I want to encourage you to call Megan Lane. Her email is here. It's a different last name. It's Benedetti M at uhd.edu. She's one of our representatives in financial aid, and she can support you in understanding what your options are after graduation so you're not concerned you know that you have different options for loan forgiveness. Okay. At this time... On a lighter note, we've covered all official business at this point. We have some fantastic student organizations at UHD, and I'm so pleased to have some of the representatives here today. So I want to start off by recognizing the Urban Educators Literacy Society. And we have the president of this group here with us today. So I want to invite her up to join us and tell us a little bit about this society and how we might be able to be involved and to join. So Megan, if you'll come on up. Good morning, everybody. How is everyone doing? I'll try to do as good of a job as up here, but she's the an expert. Um, I'd like to invite up um, our media coordinator, Rachel Becerra, and Ms. Miriam Morales, she's our secretary, to come sit with me. Um, so we are part of UELS. We, I guess it says like everything we are on the slide. Um, we do, we host events such as uh, family literacy nights at Hospitality Treasures to um, 
just promote the message of literacy. And the beautiful thing about that is that we don't just work with the children specifically, but we get the parents involved as well. Because we, like, as teachers, we work with them for the majority of the day, but once they go home, it's really important to encourage that relationship to continue between them. Um, we also offer professional development um, workshops with some of our faculty members. In the last semester, we had Dr. Pajana um, work with us, and that was fantastic. And this semester, we will be partnering with um, I know the CJ department and social work as well with Dr. Van Horn as the, the dean. So we have a lot of exciting events coming up. And uh, if you are not already a member, our first uh, meeting will be September 4th this, um, this semester. Um, so I hope you can join us. We're doing a lot of exciting how can we join? Okay, uh, you can join. We actually have applications at hand, and so if you're interested, uh, communicate with one of us, and we'll hand you an application. And the fee is uh, fifteen dollars, I believe. Uh, ten for a semester and fifteen for a year. Okay, so that's a really good deal. So just do the whole thing. Also, this uh, actually promotes as future teachers how to use literature with children, and like. It's, uh, there's many ways to use like children's book to teach kids different subjects or just about different things. You know? So it's uh, always good to um, use literature for, you know, for children. Um, exciting things within our organization. We have fundraisers, we have bake sales, we had um, breakfast sales. We also have boards when you graduate and they're free and um, t-shirts and just something exciting to take part in in helping, like Megan said, um, the House of Tiny Treasures with the students and helping the parents, you know, be able to work together as a family. And this semester we're also we part also partnering with Literacy Advance Houston, and so we'll be doing a lot of events with them, not just around our school, but like the Houston area in general. So I see some of our members here. Um, at what time are the meetings? The time is still pending because we want to see like what um, everybody's availability is, but we will be sending out a mass email through our um, email. So if you want to join or give us your email, we can let you know um, later next week once we have confirmed. Um, we're not sure. Sorry, we'll get to you. Um, but like we're not sure about um, the time exactly. But usually our meetings, we always have two sessions, so in the morning and in the afternoon, just to help accommodate everybody. So that's what we we really really try to work with your schedule because we time is precious. Actually, have a calendar in place that um, our, one of our sponsors, Dr. Well, both of our sponsors, Dr. Pinkerton and Dr. Dalton, have put together. Um, it's still a work in progress, and it will be handed out on September the fourth. But there is dates already. We'll have um, basically we do a prep before with Dr. Van Horn, and then we'll have the session at the House of Tiny Treasures a, couple, a week or two later. So you you're, you're going to be prepared ahead of time before you go. So you're not going to be scared. Of, what am I going to do? Can we sign up with you today or do yes. we? Yes. Okay. Usually we have the dates. So I haven't actually looked at the calendar in detail, but like usually the dates are set because they have to order books. I know them. our first one is the 18th of, of September. Our and first one is the 17th. <laughs> and do you have a certain amount of hours that we can say that, what if we are involved in another organization? We already think, you know, we're doing, uh, giving some our time with them as well. Do you? Do you do a certain amount of hours that we do? We have to do per semester, per week, or anything? Yes, we require you to um, attend at least three events, and that's not including our meetings because it's so important. It's really difficult to gather everybody, and if we have meetings and no one shows up, then everyone's not on the same page, and like we're just talking to like nobody basically. And so, two at least two meetings, hopefully more, and um, at least three events. And uh, we always ha we had our first um, annual reception last semester, and so hopefully you can attend that too, so that's more of a fun The incentive to attending the events is that the last year, um, is she in here, Lauren? Um, well, um, Nina. Nina is here. She won a $75 gift card for second place, and Lauren won a $100 gift card for first place in attending events. So something to look forward to. So the more you get, you get incentive points, and and each 
of our members last semester, and we'll most likely do it again in maybe later this, uh, this year, is that they each get a um, certification or a plaque <coughs> for being a member of the Any more questions? If you see one of us, you can just ask us. Yeah. And our bulletin board, oh sorry, just leave it. Our bulletin board is on the fourth floor. We have membership forms up there. We have some with us today in calendars if you'd like a copy. Um, but our information is always posted on that board, and the faculty's offices are right there too. So if you find us on Facebook, follow us on Oh yeah, we have uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, social media, so we'll message you uh, any way possible. You know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. <laughs> Thank you as officers. You guys are on top of things. We appreciate you sharing and welcoming us to join your group. We also want to talk about and offer information about Katie Pie, our Honor Society. I think we have our sponsors here. Uh, if you'd like to address the group, we welcome you to come forward. Um, so I'm Dr. Burnett and Dr. Bulls over there in the blue shirt. And we will be co-counselors for Kappa Delta Pi um, this year. Uh, Kappa Delta Pi is an international uh, honor society, so if you're doing well <laughs> in your courses, you want to be a part of an honor society, I will say this right now. Um, as you start to graduate, I see people trying to collect honor societies. You don't have to be in every honor society that's out there. Okay, so just because this one's specific to education, maybe you say, oh, I want to be in a different one. I just want to tell you now, because later on I get all these questions, oh, I got this in the mail, oh, I got this in the mail. You don't need to be in 13 honor societies. You can just be in one or you can be in none and graduate with a really high GPA. And that's, you're good to go. Um, so back to this, let me now plug this one. Um, so it's Kappa Delta Pi, it's International Honor Society. Um, the basic requirements if you're undergrad, which I've most of you are, well, all of you are undergrad right now, um, is that you have 30 hours of college credit, that you have at least 12 hours in education courses, and that you have a 3.0 cumulative GPA. So if you are not sure, but you think you're around that, go on and complete the form. I will say that we have um, initiations once a semester, so the deadline for this semester, if you want to be initiated in the fall, will be September 8th. It's always the second Monday in September. You'll go, Dr. Von Dock already showed you our urban education website. If you look on the left-hand side, you'll see a place where it says student organizations. Click on that, you'll find PDP and you fill out this preliminary form. We run, um, you get your GPA, make sure you've taken all, you know, meet all the requirements, and then we send out an invitation letter. Um, it says there, but we run it, uh, it'll probably be about two weeks after that deadline before you hear from us. So if you haven't heard from us, don't mm -hmm. worry. If it's like three, four weeks, then you know, start sending some emails. Um, but basically, what we want to do is we want, we're gonna, going to have meetings. So just to get us together, talk about our field. All right, we're in different areas, uh, like PD1, pre-PD, PD, all the way through PD3. You also have different interests. Some of you might be secondary, some of you are elementary, some of you are bilingual, some of you are interested in special ed, some of you are interested in all these different things. But just to get us together, talk about our fields, learn from each other and share our experiences. Um, additionally, uh, getting out into the community and serving our community. Okay? So we are looking for people who are interested in being leaders. We have, if you also have friends, we share this information at all the orientations, but if you have friends out at the Kingwood campus who might be interested, and out at the Northwest campus, um, because we're going to need to run meetings in these different areas. So we're looking for people to be involved. Um, if you're interested, you can contact either myself or Dr. Cole if you have any questions. Um, but the application is on that, um, under the student organization. recognize BESA, and I know we have our sponsor here. Are there student officers present as well that would like to address the group? Okay, we invite you to come forward and tell, you, tell us a little bit about your organization. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, bilingual education is student organization. As you know, we are bilingual. Not all, not all have to be bilingual, so you can still join if you're not bilingual. 
uh, pretty much we do uh, volunteering um, with any kind of uh, community uh, events. I believe this semester, on September, we're going to do the uh, Cuban Korean um, Festival. Yes, we're going to volunteer on that. Uh, we're looking for food bank to, I mean, we're going to do so many exciting uh, events. Um, requirements, you just have to uh, be there for two meetings and also two events. Um, anything that, um, we're going to provide so many that you can still do. The first, if you're going to uh, take note of that, the first meeting is going to be on September 16th. Um, we're going to offer morning and afternoon for your ability, so that way you're not going to say, I couldn't go other time. Um, and the morning is going to be from 12 to 1. It's not morning, but we call it morning, I guess. And the afternoon, um, I'm not sure, I don't know if Dr. Mitchell, which is our sponsor, um, will know about it, but maybe it's 4 to 5, I believe, the time. I haven't had the exact time, but we'll be getting it out. It's, it, maybe it's going to be around that time. So um, if you want to apply, uh, I have applications, or if you're on the side but you want more information, I have uh, a sheet where you can just put your information and we can email you. Um, for the information about it. Thank you. Thank you for all of our presenters today for our student organizations. Okay, so you had a long general session with me this morning. I hope that this session was helpful so that you might get a snapshot of the semester that's ahead and begin to even prepare beyond that for graduation and certification. So these are just some of the general guidelines. What I would like to encourage you to do is to visit the Urban Ed website under professional development and look at the handbook very closely this week. When classes begin next week, things are getting a little bit hectic, so this is a good time to go ahead and take a look at the handbook. You know where that's located now. I want to encourage you to do that, to follow up on some of the general guidelines that I've offered. Also, you'll be marking your calendars for the pre and post diagnostic dates and the other associated dates when you'll be billed, when you'll receive uh, the admission ticket via Gator Mail. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. Now I'm going to uh, encourage you, and when you leave the session, you're going to go meet with your field experience instructor. You'll hear the term FEI, so that would be the acronym for that, field experience instructor, and we'll prepare for that in just a moment. Dr. Pedron. Yeah, before, we, before you're going to your separate sections, I think I'm just going to mention this on behalf of the faculty as well as your supervisors. Please know that if you have any issues that come up, you have your family members, you have life outside UHD, although I don't know why, <laughs> you should be your life. Uh, do not feel that you are alone. If you have questions, if you have doubts, it is always better to try and talk with somebody so that you're not left out there stranded and before you realize that it's the end of the semester, you haven't been able to focus, your life is a muck, and then you really have to face the consequences. So please know that you are not alone. There are a lot of faculty members in the building. You have your supervisors, you have your advisors. Do not feel that you're alone. Just go out and reach and speak to somebody. It is always so much better to be uh, connected with someone than for you to feel that you're totally alone and you cannot share experience. Um, have an enjoyable semester, but again, a reminder, you're not alone. We're all in this together. Thank you so much, Dr. Pedrana. I know many times students feel that I shouldn't be sharing what's going on in my personal life with my faculty members or my FEI because you feel that it's personal and you don't, and sometimes students feel like they don't want to share that. Please know we're not wanting to invade your, your personal space. We just want to be able to support you. So if you feel like, I'm not sure how I can juggle all of this. I'm not sure how I can meet all this criteria. Please do reach out to us. We're happy to support you and say, let's make a plan. Because we know the criteria. We know our partner schools. We know the expectations for your degree plan. And we want to be able to support you. We know that you're here because you want this degree very badly. And you're looking forward to becoming a teacher. And we want to support you in that. So thank you, Dr. Pedrano, for helping us remember that point. Let me share with you what you'll be, some of the things that you'll be doing with your field experience instructor, your FBI, in just a few moments so you can anticipate this. Oh, yes, Dr. Could I just 
ask a question? Sure. This is about the, uh, the handbook. Yes. And I'm asking this question on behalf of the two students. They usually, if they've already made a copy, they had made it for EPD1. Are there any big changes that they need to be aware of? Good question. Okay, so if PD2, if you guys are to go on the website today and look at the handbook, there are minor revisions. Uh, the, some of the forms are slightly revised that you saw in PD1. There are also a few program revisions. They're very minor. Um, so the only thing that's coming to mind that might be slightly different for you is when you think about the time frame for turning in your lesson plan to your FEI. Previously it said one day. Well, some of our FEIs were getting the email at 11 o'clock the night before for the lesson plan at 8 the next morning. So it does say 24 hours now, just so that we're able to support our FEIs. Some of the forms are also slightly different. So if you don't want to print that 85-page document that's been revised, uh, you can just, of course, save it. You can save it on a jump drive, save it on your desktop, whatever, and you can review it electronically whenever you need. So there are minor revisions. Um, but I, I would still encourage you to take a look at that so you're reminded of our program expectations this semester. Thank you, Dr. Uh, I do have a uh, one piece of advice. I mean, this is both well from PD1 and PD2. Um, when you start working on your PD1 and PD2, please take your, your certification exam very seriously and please try to get certified by the time you graduate. And I'm going to tell you this. I worked for 12 years on the district, OK? And I had never seen, I had never seen a UHD candidate that was not, that was certified, that was not offered a job. I have seen many candidates from many other, from many other universities that they let them go. I have never seen a student teacher from UHD that was not certified, that was certified, that was not offered a job. Please get your, your stuff, get serious about it. We're here to help. We're going to offer many, many opportunities for you to review, for you to, uh, to study, take advantage of that because it is very important. Thank you, Dr. Paul. I would agree. Our district partners are eager to hire you. They are lining up to hire you. And that's not just something I'm saying off the top of my head. It is true, and I hear it every semester. They want to hire UHD because they know our, how phenomenal our students are. So on that positive note, these are the things, some of the things that you'll be talking about with your FEI in just a few moments. Be sure that if you've not signed in for this general session, the sign-up sheets are outside the door, so please do that on your way out. But when you meet with your FEI, she's going to ask you to sign in there as well for her session. You're going to have what's called a PD signature page. It's going to acknowledge that I covered certain topics with you this morning, such as PD 1 and 2 expectations, certification expectations, pre-diagnostic, post-diagnostic. You're acknowledging you know about these topics, and then you can refer to the handbook for further information. You're also going to receive an age college access request form. I know it's only the beginning of the semester, but we're going to gather some information from you so that as the end of the semester comes, our certification officer can go to TEA and clear you to take your exam. So we're going to get that information from you today. You're also going, we're going to ask and request that you sign a two-page document. It's called the Authorization to Release Student Information. This means that after you take your Texas exam, the faculty would like to have a chance to see your scores so that we know how to better support you. So we are required to ask your permission to view your test results. So your FEI will offer that paperwork to you. You're going to be offered your background checks. Some of you are going to be given that letter from me that requests you to do the online background check by this Friday. Others are going to be given that hard copy background check to fill out today, and I will be delivering it to our get serious about it. We're here to help. We're going to offer many, many opportunities for you to review, for you to, uh, to study, take advantage of that, because it is very important. Thank you, Dr. Paul. 
Thank you, Dr. Cole. I would agree. Our district partners are eager to hire you. They are lining up to hire you. And that's not just something I'm saying off the top of my head. It is true, and I hear it every semester. They want to hire UHD because they know our, how phenomenal our students are. So on that positive note, these are the things, some of the things that you'll be talking about with your FEI in just a few moments. Be sure that if you've not signed in for this general session, the sign-up sheets are outside the door, so please do that on your way out. But when you meet with your FEI, she's going to ask you to sign in there as well for her session. You're going to have what's called a PD signature page. It's going to acknowledge that I covered certain topics with you this morning, such as PD 1 and 2 expectations, certification expectations, pre-diagnostic, post-diagnostic. You're acknowledging you know about these topics, and then you can refer to the handbook for further information. You're also going to receive a page called Texas Request Form. I know it's only the beginning of the semester, but we're going to gather some information from you so that as the end of the semester comes, our certification officer can go to TEA and clear you to take your exam. So we're going to get that information from you today. You're also going, we're going to ask, request that you sign a two-page document. It's called the Authorization to Release Student Information. This means that after you take your Texas exam, the faculty would like to have a chance to see your scores so that we know how to better support you. So we are required to ask for permission to view your test results. So your FEI will offer that paperwork to you. You're going to be offered your background checks. Some of you are going to be given that letter from me that requests you to do the online background check by this Friday. Others are going to be given that hard copy background check to fill out today, and I will be delivering it to our district partners this week. If you're a paraprofessional, I need you to check in with your FEI today after the session. Ask her, am I on your list? I've been approved. I want to make sure that you know that I'm a paraprofessional. If you're a paraprofessional and you've not sought approval yet to be using your para status for the semester, I need you to visit with your FEI and she's going to ask you to follow up with me. So these are some of the items that you'll be talking with your FEI about this morning. She'll also be preparing you for the semester. So I want to offer again my support, my sincere congratulations to you for being in this program and having all of your hard work lead you to this point. You're almost there. You're almost graduated. Should you need anything, please reach out to me. I'm happy to support you, even if I'm not your faculty member, as a member of PD 1 and 2, and also as your representative to our district partners. So if there's anything I can ever do to support you, I encourage you to reach out and contact me. As you're leaving today, make sure that you sign out here. I want us to take maybe about a 10-minute break. And then you'll be meeting with your FEIs. There's four FEIs that are represented here. If you don't know your FEI's name, you can check the sign-in sheet on the way out and see with whom you'll be meeting. Um, if you're with Aldine, you're going to be staying here with Ms. Matter. The other three FEI groups are going to be meeting on the second floor upstairs in about 10 minutes. So I want to thank you for your time and your enthusiasm as you start this semester. And right now, I welcome you to make the transition to your FBI sessions, and I hope you all have a lovely day.